Scott. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, welcome back, everyone, uh, to the third day of, of MRS. Uh, last yesterday had a, a couple of really outstanding panels, and we have um, outstanding panels today as well. Uh, we thought, uh, I wanted to say a word about the, the program committee. You can find the names and affiliations of the many people who gave generously of their time to help uh, think about this program, uh, who we could reach out to, to moderate uh, panels, to have panelists, to have some of the, the keynote speakers. And uh, I just want to extend my my great gratitude to all of them. And you can, you can find them on the online uh, agenda for, for this. So again, again, thank you. Um, the uh, uh, panels that we'll have today uh, is one on ways in the Great Lakes uh, Resiliency. Uh, Craig Phillip will be uh, chairing that. And we thought it would be um, appropriate to have something focused on the inland waterways uh, and in the Great Lakes because that's where we are. Well, at least that's where <laughs> I am sitting, not that you can tell, but you know, here we are in, in Illinois and, and that's, that's our place. And so having um, uh, the Coast Guard uh, uh, influence or in, uh, input into uh, what's happening in this in this area or reporting what's happening in this area, I think is is really very very interesting. Uh, then the the second panel, uh, Henry Willis of, of Rand, um, uh, volunteered this, and that's to look at recent disasters. You know, we are in the midst of um, a uh, event. Um, a, whether one calls it a disaster, I suppose it's a disaster. Um, but uh, there is much to be learned, I think, from um, how organizations, how people um, have responded or able to respond to other other disasters that have happened. And so um, Henry volunteered to, to put together this panel, and he's got a very exciting group of, of people to, to do that. Um, I'm certain that Admiral Parks is going to make uh, an introduction uh, to our, our keynote speaker, uh, Admiral Mike Folsom. But I, but I have here uh, a statement from Joe Dorenzo, who I had to peel him off the ceiling uh, at last year's MRS when uh, he, he got an agreement from Folsom to uh, uh, participate in this, in this particular event and even give, give a keynote. Uh, so he was flying high, not as high as, as Admiral Folsom because Admiral Folsom is, has been an astronaut. So, but here's, here's Joe's uh, statement on this. Uh, Joe, Joe is dressed in Friday casual today and I think it was appropriate to, to, um, to, to be on camera giving this interview. I'm always on Friday casual and so it doesn't bother me at all, but I'm a professor. I get to do stuff like that. Anyway, Joe's statement. MRS, since its founding in 2010, has always had a list of high profile keynote speakers. They have included the commandment, com com commandant, I'm sorry, of the Coast Guard, assistant secretaries of Homeland Security, sitting members of Congress, best-selling authors, strategic thinkers, and noted historians. Our keynote this morning is perhaps the most unique and one that my uh, co-chair Joe Dorenzo has been, uh, that's Dr. Joe Dorenzo, I, I want you to know, uh, has been looking forward to this keynote because of his long-standing interest in space exploration dating back to Gemini. Uh, which says something about how old he is. Uh, this morning, we have had three-time shuttle astronaut who's done seven spacewalks and was a commander of the International Space Station. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I will uh, hand it off now to the master of ceremony. Oh, no, before I do that, remember, um, today is the day, I believe, for uh, the uh, poster sessions. And so we will say more about that uh, anon, but um, please uh, plan on participating in that. We have um, a lot of students that are uh, participating in this, and uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting things that they're talking about, and uh, they value, value and you will value the interaction that you've got with the students uh, on the poster sessions. But with that, then, um, I will hand the, uh, um, the control uh, over to, to Admiral Parks, and so take it away, Admiral Parks. Well... Doctor, thanks so much for that opportunity. Uh, uh, it is really great to have you and Joe do my job for me. Uh, I appreciate that. You know, um, I'll also have you start chewing my food for lunch. I do appreciate your opportunity to do that. But seriously, um, 
First of all, let me make a comment about your peeling Joe Dorenzo over off the ceiling. That is something most of us who know Joe have done. All of us have had that opportunity. So nothing unique there. Uh, Joe spends a lot of his time on the ceiling. And it's interesting that he has such a fine interest in being uh, in space because a lot of us who know him since his days at uh, the Naval Academy have kind of called Joe a space cadet. So I think that's something that uh, Joe comes by naturally. And if you're telling me that he's not camera ready, I could keep going on ragging on Joe because he's not going to be able to jump on to uh, say anything else. But I, uh, all kidding aside, you know, when when uh, the committee and the, the organizers were able to obtain this next uh, uh, keynote speaker, they really did hit it out of the park. And, and I, uh, you know, uh, Admiral uh, Folsom's uh, bio is impressive. I won't uh, belabor the point. The doctor did did mention some of the things, but I, I would just say one thing from my perspective, as a, uh, you know, Admiral Folsom has actually done something that has been a, a boyhood dream for I don't know how many of us, you know, children, men and women alike, who have uh, always dreamed about being astronauts. I remember having a ceramic one in my room that my mom made in her ceramics class. And I always used to think about that. I had a little ceramic uh, space shuttle, you know, capsule, uh, not a space shuttle, but a, a, a capsule in my room that I used to hide cookies in and stuff. And, you know, it was, um, I, I remember watching uh, the Apollo missions as a kid in school. And when, uh, you know, I, so I have a huge uh, admiration for anyone who has been able to be, truly be an astronaut. And, uh, you know, our, our keynote uh, for this morning has ha actually done that. He's also, uh, you know, the superintendent of uh, one of our maritime academies. Uh, so because initially when I first saw that, I said, astronaut, admiral, but he was an Air Force test pilot. How did how did we get there? How did when did he do that? And then I realized, of course, he uh, he's one of our maritime academy superintendents. So uh, I'm excited to hear what he has to say. Um, I'm really looking forward to him. I thank him for his service to our nation. And interestingly enough, this afternoon, just as a precursor to one of the panels this afternoon, for those of you that might you know, be thinking you're in the Midwest, uh, for those that are in the Gulf, you're staring down yet another uh, Category 2 hurricane heading to Louisiana, uh, Zeta, which uh, this has truly been an unprecedented year for disasters. So. Uh, we will. Our thoughts uh, go out to the people who are down in the Gulf, especially in the you know the Pelican State, Louisiana, who would be potentially hit with its sixth named storm of the year so far, which is truly uh, remarkable. And so we'll be thinking about them. So without further ado, I would love to uh, turn it over to uh, um, our keynote, Rear Admiral Michael Fosum, so that he could maybe make a couple uh, opening remarks uh, on his comments, and, and then we will. Uh, We'll watch his video and then we'll come back for a Q and A. Uh, Admiral, are you uh, are you there? Yes, I am. It, it, it's uh, great to be with you this morning. Uh, MRS uh, conference last year was my first time to attend that, and I, I was mostly in the learning mode. But for me, I, I see so many similarities from my background. You know, in the Air Force, working as a, a crew member on you know really. Small small crews on on board airplanes, primarily two seat uh, 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 fighter jets. Uh, then my time at NASA, being a crew member, a uh, crew of seven on a space shuttle team, and everything we worked through to prepare for that to really bond to the team. And then my my experience in in the the last two summers, not not 2020, of course, because everything was disrupted. But in 18 and 19, sailing with my cadets for part of their summer training, to see what it's like on a large vessel, but it's just another ship. And the crew is a crew, and the things that, that give you the professionalism to function as a crew are really the same. In the airplane, it was cockpit resource management. At NASA, it was crew resource management. And here we talk bridge resource management. And it, the, the goals are the same in, in all three domains, the, the, uh, the, the, the essence of preparing professionals as well as uh, you know the the things you do to trap errors, it's not a not a problem until nobody catches it. But we're all humans. It doesn't matter if you're an astronaut. It doesn't matter if you're the commander of the space shuttle, or the commander of the space station. You're human, and you are fully capable of making errors, no matter how much training you have. 
but the the team, the crew is there to help say, well, wait a minute, uh, not that switch, et cetera. And, uh, and I think bringing those kind of ideas into how we do uh, train mariners and, 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 you know, in the flying business and whether, you know, in air or in space, we had a lot of annual recertifications that we did every year uh, as, as just part of the preparation. And uh, that's something I'd, I'd, I'd like to see us, you know, consider you know, for this industry, and I know there's a whole lot of obstacles to that, but it, that's what helps, you know, the flying business uh, reduce its error rates and uh, and its accident rates. So that's just something to ponder, and it's a lot bigger than me. So look forward to sharing some thoughts today and then answering your uh, questions afterwards. Well, Admiral, that's great, and I really do appreciate your recognition that, uh, you know, the airship and the spaceship, they're still ships. And that's where it all started. So thanks for that. And, and with that, we'll, uh, you and I will leave the ca- go off camera and let uh, Mike run the video for us. Very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Howdy, I'm Admiral Mike Fossum. I'm the superintendent of the Texas A&M Maritime Academy, as well as a vice president of Texas A&M University and the chief operating officer of the Galveston campus. So I wear a lot of hats. I was asked to speak today, really to, to compare, talking about the evolution of risk management you know, in maritime. My background is not in maritime. My career started in the Air Force, with mostly with flight tests. Uh, I found my way to NASA, was fortunate to fly as an astronaut, on, uh, on three missions for a total of 194 days in space. And then for the last three years, I've been, I've, I've been here at Texas A&M and I've had the opportunity to go out in the summers of 2018 and 19 with our cadets to learn what it means to be a crew member on the ocean also. And there's a lot of similarities. First of all, you know, there's nothing safe about a lot of these endeavors. There's nothing safe about testing a new terrain following uh, system in a supersonic jet flying through the canyons at night, where you can only see through a very small uh, heads up display in front of you, uh, literally with rock on both sides and a little pop up display that would come up to give you the warning. You can't see it because it's outside the field of view of the forward looking infrared system, but a little arrow that says terrain. And you say, okay, don't turn, don't turn that direction. And then an, another arrow pops up, terrain, like, okay, so the canyon walls are, are down on, the, on my right side also. And what you really don't like to see is terrain pointing both ways. And you know the canyon's not straight, so sooner or later you're going you're to come to a turn. And, uh, and it, there's, there's nothing safe about that, but you learn to do it. You work together as a crew to pay attention to what's going on, uh, to know your systems, to be, make absolutely certain that you're following the precise parameters uh, of, your, uh, uh, of the test and doing this as safely as you possibly can. Uh, there's, there's also nothing safe about launching on a rocket. Uh, you know, the space shuttle sitting on the launch pad weighed about four and a half million pounds. Four million pounds of that was explosive rocket fuel. There's, there's nothing safe about it. What you're doing is managing risks. And by the way, anybody that's not a little bit concerned doesn't really understand what's going on. Um, so you, you, you learn that by, uh, you know, well, number one is trusting your team. And that entire team has an incredible, you know, adherence to, to safety and, 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 and making sure, double sure, triple sure, uh, as well as, you know, it, that the original design that, that has the safeguards that are built into the systems. Now, we've come a long way in the aviation, you know, industry. Uh, there's, it's still not foolproof. Uh, human errors can still bite you. Uh, and, and so what we train in air crews is, is never being complacent. Uh, I was a backseater, a flight test engineer, and so my job was to be in the backseat, usually running the test as we were, uh, uh, you know, preparing to test uh, new systems or even new aircraft or new modes uh, for for the uh, for the jets. And so, you know, my job was to know as much about that new system as I possibly could, to be looking for any place any any adverse effects that the new system or capability had you know on the jet that we were flying and always you know to being vigilant and we we taught that 
and and hammered that into people um and uh you know and you know and even in the the flight test business today is uh, certainly much safer than it was back in the 50s uh with the the large number of new uh, new aircraft jet aircraft coming in but you know unfortunately i went to you know more than my share of um, of uh, memorial ceremonies with with missing man formations when uh, it was a bad day and we lost a crew uh, it, and you, uh, you really, it starts with the professionalism. You have to know your aircraft. You have to know all of those systems. You know, in the Air Force, we were required annual proficiency uh, examinations, as well as check rides uh, with instructor, uh, instructor pilots to make sure that we were ready to handle the off nominal. We were ready for the bad day, that we really had that, that uh that depth of system knowledge that we needed to handle the unexpected, uh, you know, and and you never know when those things are going to pop up. I was launching one night in an in an F-15. It was a night mission, and we came up off of the runway, and and we were probably you know no more than one to two hundred feet off the runway, and uh, the, the the jet shook violently. And with these big bangs and off the right side, the inlet to the right engine was just off my uh, my elbow. And I see fireballs coming out of the front of the engine like this is bad. Uh, and the, the tower not, you know, being altogether helpful, starts screaming, you know, you're on fire, you're on fire. Uh, you know, you need to eject if, if fires confirmed you eject and uh and I, I quickly relayed what I had seen to the pilot, and he said, you know, and he correctly um, diagnosed it as a compressor uh, stalls on that right engine. He pulled the right engine back, uh, and then he pulled the right engine all the way to stop. Uh, we had no fire, uh, no continued fire. It was certainly a malfunction, but uh, we brought the airplane around with our adrenaline racing, and for a few moments there, you know. My hands were on the ejection handle uh, and as we continued to assess, brought the airplane around for the shortest flight of my career uh, for an immediate landing with uh, just about four minutes of uh, you know, time in the air. And it was the, uh, it was the professionalism, it was knowing the systems and really knowing the aircraft that, uh, that helped us uh, make the right decision that night. We saved a very valuable test airplane and uh, possibly our own lives doing an ejection at low altitude like that. Uh, it, you know, in the space business is even less forgiving. And the, uh, the training that, that crews go through, uh, beginning with the fundamental system knowledge, one system at a time, the electrical system, the, uh, the uh, uh, hydraulic uh, system powered by uh, hydrazine in the uh, case of the space shuttle and you learn it one system at a time and then you get into a, uh, a system trainer where you can tie a couple of systems together and you start to see the interactions and start to learn that eventually you get up to the point where you've got good knowledge of all of the different systems on the space shuttle that was where most of my training was and you start to put it together in an integrated simulation where you've got all of those systems that are operating and multiple crew members that are uh, that are in the sim together and then eventually uh, in addition to a training team that's running you through the hoops we had mission control actually in a in a in a uh, in a training mission control room and they are doing their job as if we were actually launching and flying a mission they're looking at the data coming into to mission control as we're seeing the data on the displays in the cockpit, uh, the evil simulation team in between us is adding, you know, inserting failures. And then as an integrated crew, both on board and in mission control, we try to sort things out and, uh, and, and figure out uh, what's, what's the malfunction, what's the proper procedure to be in right now, and, uh, you know, and how to work through this. Um, and uh, so it was, you know, very intense training that, that went on for years, even before you were eligible to be assigned to a mission. So and, and what we're teaching there is first is the professionalism to absolutely know your systems. You've got to know it. You've got to know it cold. You've got to know all of the interactions and you have to train to to recognize those uh 
uh, you know, those, those gotchas that are out there. Uh, the, the flight books, the procedures that we had with us on a space shuttle mission, they weighed about 100 pounds. And there was no way you could really memorize all of those. We did have what we call a, in the airplane business and in space, you know, the bold face items. If you saw this particular thing, you needed to take this particular action, you know, immediately. And then you open the procedure books and you make sure you're not missing anything as you go through it. Um, uh, you know, and, and a lot of what that was was really um, teaching you how to uh, how to recognize things and then how to work together. When I was a, a junior astronaut, uh, not yet assigned to a flight, I had the opportunity to jump into a sim and in, in, into a full motion simulator with a, a cr an upcoming crew that was in training. Uh, there was a, 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 a commander for the flight, was a, was a new commander. The, uh, the, the pilot was a rookie pilot. He had not flown in space yet. And, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the main flight engineer was one of the most senior astronauts that we had. He was awesome. And I'm sitting right next to him. And so I could see everything he's doing, and I'm watching what's going on in the front, uh, the front part of the cockpit there with the commander and the pilot. And it was our job to kind of oversee the procedures. I was just riding along and observing, but it was, uh, it was the, uh, the, the flight engineer's job to oversee the procedures and to keep an eye on things. And before the, the commander and pilot would throw a critical switch, they would pause and they'd say, you know, I, you know, and I, I'm showing I need to take this switch to off. And there would be uh, somebody would need to confirm that. And uh, the, uh, the, the beauty of watching this particular day was that very senior engineer had seen every trick in the book. He had been through hundreds and hundreds of simulations. And he, he, he may as well have a copy of the, the simulation script because he knew it all cold. And what he was sitting was he saw the, saw the failure come in and develop, and he was letting the other crew members diagnose it and, and try to figure out. And I look over, and he's got, his, he's got his checklist open, and he's got his finger on the right procedure, but he's not saying anything. And I, I kind of gave him a nudge and said, what, you know, what's up? They're getting all confused. And, you know, I didn't say anything because I, 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 I got it. I'm not supposed to get in the way. But he just put his hand up like this, you know, and, it, you know, just be, be quiet. Don't say anything. And the point was, let them, let them think, let them flail and let them learn. And, and that's really uh, how we worked it out. And the, the, it, you know, and it was helping them understand and develop their depth of knowledge, you know, even, even, you know, even strengthen their depth of knowledge in these different areas, gain their own confidence to understand what's going on and the confidence of the other people on the team. When they came to the conclusion, okay, we think it's this, this failure and we need to be in this procedure. Well, then the flight engineer says, Roger that I've got it. And, uh, and, and he, read out the, you know, started to help. And at that point, he picked up and started assisting and said, okay, this, you know, step one is this, we've already done it. Here's step two. And uh, to lead him through it. And I, I talked to him later and he said exactly that. You've got to help the whole team get up to that level of expertise. Yes, he was really good, really good, but he was also human. And that meant he wasn't perfect. And he was, you know, needed them to be thinking, in, you know, for that day when they might have something go on that he missed, that wasn't in a sim script that, that he had already seen, you know, 20 times. Um, and indeed, when that crew launched, they saw a failure that was not on any sim script. And they, uh, they handled it very well um, and uh, got to orbit safely, even though they had had a failure in one of the main engines on the space shuttle. The, the term that we used at NASA was error, error trapping. Uh, and the, the, the idea was if, you know, you get every critical decision, every critical move gets a second set of eyes on it, then you have a chance to prevent something from really becoming an error. If 
if the error is trapped before the switch is thrown or the incorrect action is taken, then you haven't really committed an error. Nothing bad has happened. And so it's really helping everybody understand that we are all human. We all make mistakes. And it's and uh, and, and so you, you worry about that. Always looking over your buddy's shoulder or saying, hey, double check me. I'm not certain about this before you take an action that's hard to back out of. I've got to say that the space shuttle was a beast. It was really 70s technology. Uh, we upgraded the, uh, I mean, the, the original computer. And the, I mean, the computer in the space shuttle was original, the original B-52 flight computer. Uh, archaic, archaic technology with very limited capability. And so there was very little, almost nothing that was truly automated. So there, it was with a thousand switches in the cockpit. It was very possible for you, the crew member, to commit an error that had catastrophic consequences. Um, a, a malfunction in the electrical system. Uh, we you, we can tie around. There's a lot of different buses, uh, segments of the electrical system, and you can cross tie buses to regain capability. But you always have to remember if the uh, hydrazine driven hydraulic pumps are operating. If you lose one of those major strings, you're going to take down one of those hydraulic pumps. Uh, it has to go through quite a long cool down period before you try to restart it um, or it goes boom. Uh, if you don't remember to turn the, the hydraulic, it's a manual switch. If you don't remember to turn that manual switch back to the OFF position before you reestablish the electrical controls, it will it would receive power and immediately dump hydrazine into a non-spinning, uh, very hot uh, uh, hydraulic pump that would actually cause an explosion. And due to a poor design of the space shuttle, the three hydraulic pumps and systems were closely intertwined. So you could very likely uh, take out all of your hydraulic systems. Without those, you can't gimbal the main engines of the shuttle and you can't fly it uh, as a glider. The aircraft control surfaces were dependent on hydraulic power. So those are the kind of gotchas that they, uh, you know, we had to beat into crews in uh, many, many of those simulator sessions. Uh, you know, in the Air Force, we talked about uh, uh, cockpit resource management. Uh, and my entire flying career, which spanned uh, several decades, you know, that was cockpit resource management. You've got two people or more in the airplane. You've got procedures. You've got air traffic control. Uh, but really, you've got to make the decisions up there. And it's it's keeping everybody on board, keeping everybody awake and part of the decision making. At NASA, we called it uh, crew resource management. So it's a larger number of people, uh, six people on a space station, uh, seven people on a space shuttle, but really the flight deck. The four on the flight deck were probably the most critical, but it's exact same things. And now I see in the maritime world, it's uh, it's bridge resource management. It's exactly the same concepts. Um, before I get into some of that, though, I did want to, sh I, you know, I, I we, we got to have a little fun. I was told this is supposed to be entertaining. And so what I want to do today is, as I've talked about what it's like to train and fly, and, you know, I, I'm going to show a video. It's about six minutes of my last mission from nine years ago. Uh, in my career, I was fortunate to fly uh, uh, two uh, missions on the space shuttle. Those were two week long missions. Uh, during those, I helped uh, build the International Space Station. My first mission was in 2006, second one in 2008. I was a spacewalker. And so I got to go outside uh, three times on each of those missions to help put the big pieces of the space station together. Uh, and then in uh, 2011, I launched uh, not on a shuttle again, but actually on a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. This was a very, very different spacecraft. Uh, where the shuttle was a great big huge truck uh, designed and you know, to carry large uh, large pieces of the space station up in the cargo bay and to give you a lot of capability on orbit. 
Uh, the Soyuz spacecraft is good for hauling, you know, three people and a few hundred pounds of supplies up to the space station, but it's very, very tight. Uh, whereas the space shuttle crew cabin had a lot of room to move around, uh, the Soyuz spacecraft capsule is a total of four cubic meters before you add in instrument panels, some storage, uh, the seats that you're sitting in and things like that. And so you'll see in this video, we are very, very close. Uh, I mean, you're literally uh, uh, hip to hip and elbow to elbow as you're stuck in there, really with your knees pulled up close to your chest. Um, once we reached orbit, we could get out of that four cubic meter um, descent uh, capsule, and there was another six cubic meters with a little more room to, uh, to spread out up above that's not shown in, in this video anywhere. But uh, um, the, uh, let's see, big picture, uh, the, I mean, the difference, the, the Soyuz um, spacecraft controls were very archaic, uh, going back to the early days of the Soviet space program uh, that have continued to this day. But what it is, is very, very reliable. It's a very robust and I would say even elegant design that allows, uh, you know, to, a, a lot of fault tolerance that's that's built into it. Uh, and I, I remember when I was studying and, and learning the uh, the Soyuz spacecraft, uh, going through, you know, literally the wiring and logic diagrams as I'm trying to understand everything. And I remember really being confused by one by one part of that uh, the logic flow. Like what is going on here? I don't understand this uh, the, the, this complexity, and then I realized that complexity was adding safeguards to a depressurization valve that the that the uh, uh, spacecraft had. And way back in the early days of the uh, the Russian space program or the Soyuz uh, um, space program, they had uh, they had accidentally depressurized a, uh, a spacecraft and killed a crew. And so all these extra safeguards were there for a reason. What I really liked about learning the, the, the Russian Soyuz spacecraft was it was so elegant. It was simple enough to be able to trace the logic flows and understand all of that. And I will confess, no human being really understood all of the space shuttle. It was just too complex uh, with, you know, for, you know, for, you know, for, for one person to understand everything about it, all of its nuances. But it was really cool to get to know the Soyuz because we, we could understand it to that depth. Uh, it was also different, just as a side note, is uh, it, it, flying on a Russian spacecraft meant I had to achieve a, uh, uh, a, a, a very significant level of uh, Russian language capability. Um, that's the hardest thing I've done in my life. Um, rocket science is easy, but uh, try, me trying to learn how to speak Russian uh, was the hardest thing I've done in my life. Uh, but all of the displays, controls, procedures, and communication with the ground in the Rush in the Soyuz spacecraft is done in the Russian language, and so it adds another whole level of complexity to it, um, as well as a very, very odd uh, design to it, um, and. But again, there's a simple elegance to it. And there's a manual control to that spacecraft that we absolutely did not have in the, uh, in the, in the space shuttle program or any previous thing. Uh, they, they believe in keep it simple and, and the kind of capabilities that, that would be a backup capability that are just about fail proof. And one example is you've, you, it, it, there are situations where you've got an emergency on orbit and you need to bring that capsule back to the ground. Um, the, you could have a failure of, of certain systems. You could have had an emergency on the space station that required you to jump into the spacecraft and leave uh, on very short notice. Um, and so it, in order to burn the, well, they prepare for this every day we have a list for every every orbit. We we do 16 orbits a day. During every orbit, there's specific times that if for some reason we have to get back to somewhere, anywhere on the ground, here's a time that you, if you are all prepared and you start the deorbit burn engine at this time and you allow it to burn for this long, then 
the ballistics are going to carry you back to the vicinity of that pre-planned emergency landing site. And that's beautiful. The space shuttle, we really depended on it landing at Kennedy Space Center. And we had a few options, but you had to have three miles of concrete to land to the space shuttle. And really, because of some of the hazardous materials, the hydrazine I mentioned, uh, you don't want to drop into some place unannounced, although if it was a real big emergency, we would. But uh, the Soyuz was set up, so you've got this, and every morning, the Soyuz commander would print out this, this list of, this, of the uh, 16 opportunities for today, and that paper copy would be in the spacecraft. And every morning, we swapped that out just in case today's the bad day. So let's just say that we have separated from the space station and uh, we've got a, a planned landing site for, uh, let's just say, Kansas, uh, because Kansas is largely flat. And we'll, we'll mess up somebody's cornfield, but we can probably hit Kansas. And, uh, but there's a failure of the computer. There's a manual control system in there using uh, simple direct commands to the jets and there's an optical sight because it's very important that your spacecraft be lined up so that the tail end is going forward, if you will, so that when you burn the engine, you get the right uh, amount of deceleration or change in your velocity that it drops you into the atmosphere at the proper angle. Uh, now, computers can do that really well, but you can do it 100% manually using a, a, an optical sight and you can maneuver the spacecraft and you learn how to do this in training. So you can see the ground and then you can swing yourself around so you can actually see the ground tracking straight on the lines that are scribed onto that optical site. Now it's really important that you get it actually, to get a really precise burn, you need to be uh, what we call local vertical, local horizontal. You need to be oriented so that you're at, at, at really pointed directly down at the ground, not at some off angle. And so there's eight prisms around that optical site, and you keep adjusting until you can, and those prisms look out to the side. And what you want to do is get the horizon that the, the, the different, you know, where you see space and you see the, uh, the, the edge of the earth equal in all eight of them. And when you achieve that, you know, you're at the perfect attitude. Now, when the clock says burn, you flip two switches, no computer involved. If these two switches are flipped on, the engine lights. When the clock says it's time to turn it off, you turn it off and you're heading toward the ground. And it's beautiful. That's what I call an elegant design that you can, it, it gives you some options on the bad day. So let me, uh, let me just say that the, the, the training for the space station mission, the dedicated training for this mission was about two and a half years. And uh, over about 50% of that time, I was in Russia, in uh, Star City outside of Moscow, learning a new spacecraft. Uh, I, we also trained in Germany uh, and in Japan uh, and in Canada with different partners for the space station program. So it was a very, very long road. And uh, finally, uh, we're getting ready to go to, uh, well, we're, we're at the, uh, the, the launch center for the Russian space program is actually not in Russia, it's in Kazakhstan. Uh, former Soviet uh, satellite state in a place called Baikonur Cosmodrome. And uh, it's really exciting to finally be there as we get ready to, uh, 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 as we go through the final preparation. And by the way, speaking of quarantines, before you uh, get on a ship, we had a two week quarantine before we got on a ship. And that was to make sure that we didn't, that pre-COVID, of course, but just, just to make sure or minimize the chances that we would bring some kind of bug or, uh, you know, infection or cold or whatever with us on board uh, the spacecraft. So let's go ahead and roll the video and uh, we'll see what this is like. It was, uh, I mean, for me, it was an amazing adventure. I joined Expedition 28 and then was the commander of Expedition 29. Uh, we did a public suit up with my family watching that, and then we go uh, report into the big Russian space boss. About 1.30 in the morning on June 7, 2011, we uh, lit up the night sky. The launch pad that we launched from was the same one that Yuri Gagarin had used when he launched, uh, became the first human in space almost exactly 50 years before us. It was a nine-minute ride to orbit, uh, and then uh, we, we 
transitioned to spacecraft mode, and uh, two days later, we came in and docked. Uh, back then, it took about two days to do the full rendezvous to get the space station and, uh, and our spacecraft all lined up. Uh, now they could do it in about six hours after uh, uh, securing our uh, spacecraft to the space station and getting the hatch seals checked, we came barreling across to the other side. While we were there, we worked on over 200 different scientific experiments. We got to work fairly quickly monitoring our own health and all. But a lot of what we did was get ready for the very last space shuttle mission. You could see Space Shuttle Atlantis through that window so we were there for STS-135. It was great to share part of that historical mission. While they were there, my buddy Ron Guerin and I suited up for our fourth spacewalk together. It's uh, working on the outside of the space station and looking in the back window of the shuttle. And it was another six and a half hours, brought my total up to 48 hours working outside, got it all done without safely without dropping any tools. After they left, it was back to work, monitoring our health, doing a lot of different measurements, drawing blood from each other. We collected blood, saliva, hair, skin, urine, um, you name it, uh, all in the name of science. Uh, we had uh, actually had the first humanoid robot in space. He's the one on the left here. <laughs> Plant growth is kind of neat, not much green up there. That's how you exercise with a treadmill or a harness to hold you to the treadmill, and this is how you take a shower. No showers, soapy water and a washcloth for six months. That's where I slept, when the sleeping bag on the wall. Uh, the, the, the science was a large part of the fun, doing a lot of different things. Uh, it, while we were also worked on the systems of the space station to keep the water purification, air purification systems running. Uh, and it wasn't all work and no play. Here's what happens when the space station is accelerating because they're doing a reboost. Now, Satoshi Furukawa, my Japanese rookie uh, crewmate, he got a little bored on the weekends and uh, learned how to play baseball with himself. He could pitch that ball and get to the batter's box before the ball, batter up Satoshi, and he even got so good he could field his own hits. <laughs> you know, we talk about floating in space, but you're not really just floating in space. Uh, you're flying in space. Yeah, you're going 17 and a half thousand miles an hour, but inside, it's all relative. So uh, you just grab on and, and uh, try not to hit anything expensive. Little water squeezed out, forms a sphere. And, uh, you know, the inside of the space station is large. It's about the size of 12 school buses in these different modules or, or the internal volume of a 747. This was my favorite pastime, doing low-light photography. This is actually the Aurora Australis or Southern Lights uh, in the Southern Indian Ocean. And it's actually individual photos. And I'm so excited because I couldn't describe to you what it's like to fly over Japan at night. But by stringing these individual photos together, you could see what it looks like from our point of view. Uh, living up there for a long period of time is uh, you doing the mundane things like cutting each other's hair too. Our uh, second half of my crew, Dan Burbank and his guys, were delayed by two months due to a Russian rocket uh, failure. Uh, thankfully, nobody hurt, but uh, we, we were lonely and shorthanded up there for a while. Um, we could bring about two pounds of personal items home, so we're backing away from the station. The fireballs here are parts of our ship that are burning up on purpose on the way in. We landed on the steps of Kazakhstan two days before Thanksgiving, uh, before dawn under parachute with the blowing snow, a uh, pretty good wind going. Uh, that's what it looks like to get 200 pounds of dead weight out of a spaceship. They were piling blankets on us like they were afraid of us getting cold. Folks, we weren't afraid of being cold. We had just ridden home in a meteor. Yeah, that's my entire spaceship. Uh, here's shortly after the landing as they're opening the hatch. After a short helicopter ride in the uh, traditional funny hat ceremony, I got on an airplane headed from uh, uh, Kazakhstan to uh, uh, Ellington Field uh, in the south side of Houston, close to NASA, where my family was waiting for me the day before Thanksgiving. And uh, that was an about five and a half month journey and uh, wouldn't trade it for anything. What do you all think? Was that a good, good adventure or what? You bet. Oh, I love sharing that. Then now let's talk about the similarities. How do these things all relate? Folks, in a, in a really big way, it's about professionalism. It's about error trapping. 
It's about training and always maintaining that that professionalism in your crew that that you trust each other and that that you know everybody on this crew can speak up with a concern and that's really set by the captain or the commander uh nasa has had commanders that didn't want uh, did not want anybody to interrupt them or tell them what they thought i will tell you what you think that's dangerous it's absolutely dangerous and so the, the that the captain's got to instill that spirit of teamwork and trust, which empowers the team to speak up. And, uh, you know, and, and like like my example of the flight engineer that intentionally didn't speak up in training because he wanted to pull out the crew. He wanted them to develop their confidence and their skills in each other. Uh, you know, it, 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 those kind of things are so important. Uh, and that's how the how the team gets through it. Uh, the hijinks, flying in space, the stupid astronaut tricks. That's just about maintaining some of the the whole esprit de corps. You got to have a little bit of fun when you're up there too. We work like dogs. You know, Monday through Friday, we're we're just complete pedal to the metal, working late into the night. You're living at work. Uh, Saturdays were usually a work day. You have a little a uh, little more little bit of time off. And we tried to maintain Sundays as uh, as time off in space. Even it, it was important to us up there. That gave us a chance to work out a little extra. Maybe uh, uh, we we were fortunate that we could do a video conference with our families, and we cherished that opportunity for at least 15 minutes on Sunday, and usually a little bit longer. Um, but you know, a little bit of that personal time and downtime to uh, to regather your energy before the week ahead. Um, I also dealt and won't go into details, but you know, with a with a crew member that that was struggling some uh, on on the on his rookie flight, and if he made a mistake, it it paralyzed him. And when you're in in dynamic flight during launch or critical operations, you don't have time to be paralyzed. And so we spent a lot of time working with the other uh, senior uh, senior crew member. Uh, on the crew, it says, "How we get? How do how do we help him? Because it it it's not okay. He would be so upset that he was human and made a mistake that he would lock up. And there's more coming. And the training team knows it, and they can almost sense it. And so they're throwing some more stuff to to in, to push us really beyond what we were capable of doing yet. And we had to increase our capability to uh, to cope. And so we we you know. And so we worked really hard with this crew member to, you know, to to help him understand how confident we were in his capability. Uh, and, and that that didn't do enough. It, he, he knew the stuff. He just had this personal thing where he expected himself to be perfect and nobody's perfect all the time. And so what we what we actually came up with was if, if if everybody was quiet saying, "Ooh, that was a bad call. And he would he would just just collapse in on himself. But what we found was we'd give him the five seconds to, you know, for, for, you know, for him to kind of own it and feel bad. And then right away we'd say, Ooh, you know, check this parameter, you know, that, you know, we better watch this one now too. And it's, and, and it broke the pattern. And once we started doing that, you know, he, he had a moment to kick himself and then we would say, okay, what's coming up next. And uh, hey, let's keep an eye on this. Uh, you know that would be the next really bad failure, and that diverted his attention, got him back in the game. In the end, he flew with excellence, you know, and had a great mission. And so, you know, really in summary, it, it, I've seen the same things on the ship the last two years. When I was fortunate to 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 observe the the teams, I'm not a mariner. I'll, I will never earn that title. But what I've seen is the essence of being a good crew member is the same. It doesn't matter if you're in the air, if you're in space, or if you're the original crew on a ship at sea. The same thing about professionalism, know your stuff, uh, work hard, valued in the air, valued in space, valued at sea. Everybody wants a crew member who works hard and gets along well with others. You're looking out for your crewmates, and maintains a positive mental attitude. That's the kind of people we all want.
And and really, when we're talking though about you know those basics of being a good crew member, and then how do we enhance the safety of maritime operations? It's air trapping. It's professionalism. It's it's setting that standard from the top down on every vessel and every company on what the expectations are, rewarding the good behavior, rewarding those successes when you avert a disaster with good decision making, uh, and being, you know, really the, the the one thing I saw in in aviation that 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 we may have some work to do is learning the lessons from those days when everything doesn't go as well as you wish it does. Um, and, and But you've got to learn from the mistakes. You've got to do the, uh, have the hard conversations and, and make sure that you get as much benefit out of every, every incident as possible to help reduce the, poss- the probability of it happening again, help every crew member understand the importance of this, and, and how I can be add this to my awareness. And then we as leaders need to look for ways that we can continue to bring that body of knowledge in and help you know, our cadets and our mariners uh, you know, be ready for the bad day because they're gonna have them. If you're in this business as a crew member, any length of time at all, you're gonna have a bad day, whether it's in the air or space or at sea. And that's our job is to be ready trap the errors, and have the team ready to respond as necessary. I think I've about used up my time, and I look forward to uh, doing my best to answer any questions you might have. Well, Admiral, uh, that was was fantastic, and uh, I really, really appreciate that. Your your, um, focus on... on, uh, you know, le- learning from our lessons. Otherwise, they, if they're not lessons learned, if they're just lessons observed. So that really is uh, that is really great. And then we've got some questions, and I know uh, we've only got about uh, 10, 10, 12 minutes left. So I want to go through a couple of these questions, but I also want to bring people's attention to uh, the chat box to make sure that they're looking because uh, your uh, fellow um, Air Force veteran, uh, Ma- uh, General uh, uh, Church Key, has put some wonderful comments in, uh, obviously, in, in not only support of his uh, uh, fellow Air Force veteran, but also just, I think, based on his personal experience. So that's uh, that's great. So let me ask a question, if I might, on behalf of one of our, uh, our listeners. And how does this compare, the things you talked about specifically, uh, with uh, the current procedures for NASA's uh, commercial crew program that is going on right now? You know, we're using the same, uh, actually the same, the whole training methodology. Uh, we're, we've been working very closely with the the, the, uh, the two commercial uh, teams that are developing it. SpaceX, of course, has had their uh, first human mission to the space station. Uh, their next crew is getting ready to go soon. And uh, Boeing, which has a you know longer relationship uh, you know with NASA and in the space business, uh, they had some setbacks, but they're they're coming along, and um, we'll have a you know NASA crew are training to uh, fly on the, uh, the the Boeing spacecrafts also. Uh, first will be a test mission, and then uh, they will begin using that for rotation. The next SpaceX mission will be a, uh, a launch to the space station with four crew members, which is awesome because the space station crew will be up to seven at that point. And we've all been looking forward to that day to get more of the, the science objectives done. Uh, but we're, we're using the same thing. Uh, the astronauts continue to fly in the T-38 jets as part of the continuation, you know, just re- overall readiness training where a mistake has consequences different than being in a simulator. So you can't fly in space very often. So we do fly that as part of our training in the T-38s. Um, so it, it's an exciting time. We've, uh, you know, uh, the, the Russian partnership was controversial when they came in as partners in the summer of 93 with the space station. Um, but it, it, it was very fortuitous for us when this, we had our uh, space shuttle accident, uh, particularly in 2003, that shut the uh, space shuttle down for uh, two and a half years. Um, so we were, because we had access to the space station using the Russian Soyuz spacecraft, we were able to continue uh, the full operations up there. Uh, a little less margin, and uh, things got a little dicey at times. 
uh, especially when in the summer of uh, 2011, the uh, Russians uh, were launching a cargo ship to the space station and had a rocket failure and scattered the uh, cargo ship and a lot of things coming to me personally uh, across Siberia. But uh, the, the rocket that they were using is about 90 percent the same as the one they launch humans in. So it was a uh, um, it was pretty dicey. We had enough food uh, and most supplies to, to get by for a period of time, but there was a lifetime. Uh, the the, the, the Soyuz spacecraft we were in could only be on orbit a maximum of, of 200 to 210 days, and then you really had to bring it home. So we were concerned about, you know, about having to leave the space station un, without a crew on board and the crew really needs to be there to uh, support the uh, care, you know care and feeding and uh, uh, maintenance on that uh, on the space station and we've had now crews on board for almost exactly 20 years 20 years continuous human presence they, and uh, the new commercial um, spaceships give us the the U.S. capability for the first time since July of 2011, and it's great to have them going. Well, that's that's uh, that's great. You know, it's kind of uh, think about this: how many ships do we put to sea that uh, don't dock for, you know, don't don't pull in for uh, something in uh, you know, let alone years? So uh, that that is an amazing uh, statistic. So, Admiral, you've talked a little about uh, you know the. Um, crew resource management, you know, heart, human error, accident reduction training, as it morphed into that, and bridge resource management. So, you know, in addition to the things that are uh, inherent in that situation awareness, crew fatigue, crew selection, you know, event complexity, environment, things like that, do you find other things that, uh, you know, maybe are called space resilience practices that you think can be adopted in the maritime environment or maybe should be adopted in the maritime environment? You know, and and again, I I'll, I'll never claim to be a mariner, uh, but the one thing that strikes me though is, uh, you know, industry wide, there's not a not a I don't think there's as much you know continuation training and recertification, uh, certainly not compared to what we had in the Air Force, you know, or at NASA, where you know we you know both in the in the T thirty eight you know annual check rides, annual uh, 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 crew resource management specific check ride uh, as well as uh, malfunction simulators and things like that as well as written tests uh, that we took uh, you know quick bold face exam weekly boom you'd write down all those immediate actions for the uh, seven or eight critical uh, you know critical reaction things on the on the little t-38 jet and we had the same thing for uh, you know for the uh, space shuttle you had to you had to get in that simulator and get wrung out uh, and it, it, if you weren't doing it as part of normal training, then you would go in there anyway. Uh, and the uh, it, 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 and and I know that this is it's a diff very different world than you know basically working for the government as a, uh, a military air crew or as a NASA air crew. But you know, and and I I, I believe that some companies have their own requirements along this line that they do to help, you know, maintain that edge. And that the, the whole question is, how do you maintain the edge? And, and how do you make sure that people are really getting in the books, that, that are remembering these obscure things that don't come up all the time? So when the bad day happens, you know, that's like, boom, okay, I remember, I remember that, I remember where to find it, but it forces you to go in the books. And when you take written uh, uh, hold system exams annually, uh, written instrument exams annually, uh, you know, for, for a jet, that forces you into the books and they change them and you've got to dig through and, uh, and find that stuff. And it, yeah, it's a pain and uh, we all cuss it. I've been flying for 20 years. I don't need to do this, but yes, you do. I always would learn a little bit every time I would do that. But, you know, that that's a great point, Admiral, and I, and I can remember, you know, some of the lessons uh, I learned early on. I had a, uh, a captain on one of my ships who would come up and, you know, ask rules of the road questions, you know, nautical rules of the road. And uh, that's a good uh, captain. And and he would then come over and say, come over to the radar and say, how do you do this? And uh, then he'd walk over to the engine order telegraph and say, 
what do you do? How do what do you do if this thing doesn't work? And my gosh, was he a complete pain in my butt all the time. But you know what? What was really fascinating, Admiral, is I became that guy uh, and was a pain in a lot of other people's butt because we don't have a retesting requirement. And so I think you bring up a good point. I'd like to, I'd like to pivot and ask you uh, from a really, really very successful mariner, uh, one of your colleagues in the Maritime Academy world from uh, Captain David Moskov is asking, uh, he's the lead instructor for the bridge resource management at Kings Point. Uh, and he's kind of interested if you have any specific integration uh, suggestions from the NASA CRM to you would use at A&M a bridge resource management course so that you could consider them. Uh, and you know, imitation is the purest form of flattery. And when you get a ship driver talking to an astronaut, you know, that gets a little dicey for some of us, but go forth. <laughs> you bet. Well, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Captain Moskov, for the question. Uh, I'm not there yet. I've, I've been the uh, superintendent for a little less than a year. Uh, but one of the things that uh, that I have have started talking to the team about was actually what I want is an integrated sim, not just the standalone bridge simulator. I want to get the engineering simulation tied together with it to get the bridge crew talking to the engine crew and then have the evil instructor team kind of in between that adds a failure that forces that communication and that knowledge because something that it, it, it looks like to me is there's not a good cross, uh, uh, cross flow of understanding for those two different worlds. You know, engineers, uh, you know, they live their, their life and do their shifts down below by and large. And then the deckies don't want to be caught dead going down that ladder. Uh, and, but they, they, and I, I have emphasized on the ship, you know, deckies, you better show your engineers some love. You need to know what's going on down there because when they're ma giving you a call, you need to understand what they're saying and, and vice versa. You need to understand what their capabilities are down there to respond to things you might you know, be dealing with on the bridge. But I would love to actually get those simulations tied together so we could train a whole team in uh, you know ship resource management, not just bridge. I want bridge and engine working together. Well, that, that's I a great that. point. And, and I, I just want to offer a comment that uh, one of the practices we put into place on, on one of the ships I was on is that we actually had the engineer of the watch go to the bridge before he went down the engine room. And we had the OOD, the deck officer, go down the engine room before they came up to relieve the watch. And uh, we forced it. It was, it was, yeah, you can imagine though, there was a little bit of Athens and Sparta there, but you know what? After a while, it became second nature and it really helped. So, um, Admiral, we've got uh, only a minute left. I want to give you a chance to close out, but I also do want to tell you that uh, there's a great comment in here from uh, our friend Joe Dorenzo. And I, I did take a couple cheap shots at him, which I took as my prerogative because, you know, he wrote me into this. So I feel like I could do that, but he did want to say thank you to you and he really hopes that uh, you and your school will be able to join us in Houston next year for you know and that, that's Joe you're not finished with your first presentation he's already roping you into your next one so uh, we, we really appreciate your time and uh, thank you very much and I'll leave the last words to you sir okay you bet well you know yeah at, at the beginning chat we talked about childhood dreams and yeah I was I was one of those I was a geek uh, you know, loved the whole space business, vividly remember Apollo 11 and walking into my backyard. I grew up on the Mexican border in South Texas, you know, late at night and looking up at that moon. And uh, after watching the footprints be put out there by uh, Buzz and, and uh, Neil and, uh, you know, and that that captured me and it became kind of a lifelong passion uh, to pursue that uh, pursue that path. And I've been blessed beyond measure. Uh, you know, there's no doubt about it. Uh, I, and uh, there was no guarantee. It actually took me a number of years to get selected as an astronaut, but I wouldn't have traded uh, any bit of that journey uh, for it for anything. Uh, it was uh, a year ago when I was commissioned by Admiral Busby. It was, as he noted, the strangest commissioning in history when an Air Force colonel was putting on an admiral's uniform. Uh, my uh, 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 Dress blues look really funny with the uh, Air Force uh, astronaut silver wings on them. <laughs> but, you know, it's okay. 
there, there's just there are remarkable similarities in being a crew member. And I talk about being a crew in air, space, and the original crews on ships at sea. But it, the same essentials of professionalism and the kind of people want in their crew apply to any office on shore also. So it's really about leadership and professionalism, and that's where my my passions are. And to bring the uh, Texas A&M Maritime Academy and to 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 help everybody understand the importance of that. To be professionals in the job, you've got to as a professional, you've got to know your stuff, and you got to stay current on it. And I'm you know, I, I'm I'm very passionate about that because I lived that in my whole Air Force and NASA career, 36 years doing that. And so that's become just a way of life for me. And I hope to, you know, to, to preach and to, uh, to share that. And uh, at the same time, figure out how to, look, how to have a little fun. So we had stupid astronaut tricks on the space station and we've got, uh, you know, the cadet games, you know, on uh, some Sunday afternoon at sea uh, where, you know, you get to have a little bit of the antics and, and things like that, because that, that does build the esprit de corps, the memories uh, that you uh, that you carry with you. It's we we often said there's there's no bad mission, but there were bad crews, you know. And I I want to to preach what it means to be a good crew member, and uh, you know, and for our for our graduates, you know, and everybody, because when when we do that, then we'll have lower accident rates, we'll have lower attrition rates from the industry. Let we'll people really enjoying their job because they they're meshing and they're all working hard with a common mission, common goal: get the job done, get the cargo delivered, and get home safe. So thanks a bunch. Thanks for inviting me to uh, share some stories today. It's been fun. Well, that's great. Thanks. Thanks very much. And and keep doing the great work of spreading the gospel of safety at sea. Uh, preach away, Admiral. That's that's awesome. And and thanks uh, thanks for your effort.